Hi, I'm Circe Westner, the director of the Museum of the American Military Family in Tejeres, New Mexico. And this is a special presentation from our Veterans Collaborative. It's the Veteran Family Community Collaborative, and it's also based in Tejeres. Over the summer, we're presenting a series of nutrition programs, and today we're joined by Army veteran Chelsea Tursevich and Air Force spouse um, Meredith Grundon. Um, both of them are PA fellows, and um, they are focusing on nutrition. I guess I should say that they are PA Foundation Nutrition Fellows. So welcome, ladies. We're going to have our first program, I guess Chelsea is going to uh, present on nutrition for prediabetes and diabetes, and then Meredith will speak about pre and post-op surgery nutrition. I'm excited today. We are excited to be here as well, so. Yes. All right. All right. Well, so as Circe mentioned, my name is Chelsea. I am an Army veteran who actually went through the military PA program called IPAP. And today I'm going to talk to you about nutrition for prediabetes and diabetes. So I wanted to start off by showing this and also talking to you about my personal experience. Um, I, I think it helps people, patients, other clinicians better understand why I get involved in this type of nutrition education. These are actually pictures of me between the ages of 19 and 22, so before my military career. Um, I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. I didn't exercise at all. I wasn't sleeping very much. I was a college student, so generally first time out on my own, maybe not making the best nutritional and health decisions for myself. The last time I weighed myself, I weighed about 240 pounds, and I definitely put on at least another 10, maybe even more pounds than that afterwards. For reference, I'm 5'3", uh, so I was definitely obese. I was wearing a size 18 pants. They were tight on me as well by the time I started losing weight. I ended up marrying an Army soldier when I was 22. And at my very first appointment with an Army doctor, she decided to complete some fasting labs for me just to kind of see where I was at, or at least that's where I thought she was going with it. When I followed up with her two weeks later, though, I was in for quite a rude awakening. Uh, her exact words were, Chelsea, you're fat, you're pre-diabetic, and you're probably going to die young from diabetes if you don't make some major life changes. Uh, was that shocking? Yes. Was it hard to hear? Definitely. But it's definitely what I needed to hear personally to jumpstart my life onto a more healthy road and having a better nutrition relationship overall. Over the course of 18 months, I lost about 100 pounds with the help of that doctor, as well as the nutritionist she sent me to. Uh, I started to incorporate more physical activity into my life, initially just doing light stuff like walking and water aerobics, uh, also changing the whole way that I eat, learning that I needed sleep in my life as well. And since then, I joined the Army myself, like you heard, and became an Army PA. I can cycle long distances, sometimes doing 30 miles at a time. I've run a half marathon and I'm actually training for another one right now. And my life is just different. I have a new relationship with food where it's not something that I use to cope or something that I do just because it tastes really, really good, even if I'm full. And I incorporate a lot more vegetables, uh, fruits into my diets because I know it makes me feel good day to day. That's impressive. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I like to tell people that even when I work with people day to day in the free clinic here in Savannah where I live, I start with that story because I think it helps people realize that clinicians were real people too. We deal with the same kind of struggles that they do. Mm -hmm. I was also able to completely reverse my pre-diabetes diagnosis, which was really important for me considering I was only 22 at the time. So many people have heard of diabetes, maybe pre-diabetes as well but we don't necessarily know what it means, what it encompasses. Um, so the most common type of diabetes is type two diabetes, which generally means our body isn't using insulin appropriately anymore. And pre-diabetes is basically like a milder version of it. It's still using the insulin, but maybe not quite as well as it should. Pre-diabetes can also be completely reversed. In some cases type two can as well with certain types of uh, surgeries or medications. There is a big concern though, especially right now with the pandemic. So as you can see on the slide, one in four adults over the age of 65 has diabetes. With COVID, we also know that certain people are predisposed to more severe types of uh, COVID 
if they have certain medical conditions. And diabetes is actually one of those ones that predisposes us to a more severe case. Even if we're vaccinated, we still might have a more moderately like type of case than if we weren't vaccinated. So it's really important to understand how diabetes plays a role in our life and whether complications might arise from it, particularly with this pandemic that we deal with. I have a question, is this for just the United States or is this in the world overall, one in four adults, one in 10? That's, yeah, good question. That's in the US specifically. Okay, all right. So what we're looking at here and what I'm gonna talk about now is the lab values that we as clinicians use to determine if you are pre-diabetic or have type two diabetes. The ones that we use are a hemoglobin A1C or a fasting glucose lab. So a hemoglobin A1C is a three month average of what our blood sugars are like running through our bodies versus a fasting glucose. That's kind of like a snapshot in time where we've gone into that lab, we haven't eaten or really drank anything other than water for you know eight plus hours. That's what we're seeing where our blood sugar is at that moment in time. With the hemoglobin A1C, we can just use one value of that to make a diagnosis of prediabetes or diabetes versus with fasting glucose, we need two different labs to say that that person has prediabetes or diabetes and they need to be on separate days. So we can't do the same lab in the same day. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's shift a little bit into the risk factors that put us at risk for prediabetes and diabetes. And they kind of fall into two different categories. So we have what are considered modifiable, things that we can change, and non-modifiable, things that we're kind of stuck with and can't really do much about. So let's start with the, the non-modifiable ones, the ones that we can't change. We can't change our age, right? We looked at that slide before that said one in four Americans has diabetes. Our age alone puts us at risk. So 45 years or older, we have an increased risk for it. There are certain gynecological, so female issues that can potentially put us, put us at risk as well. So some females have a diagnosis of something called polycystic ovarian syndrome that puts us at risk for insulin resistance. Women who have gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy or who have large babies are at increased risk for developing diabetes later in life. Genetics, our family history, particularly, you know, parents, siblings, grandparents, if more than one person has diabetes, you are at more increased risk for developing diabetes yourself. But then there's some things that we can change. If we smoke, and even if we could at any point of our lives, so even if we are over the age of 65 and we've been smoking for, you know, 30, 40 plus years, quitting now decreases that risk. Getting exercise or activity level. You know, a lot of us, particularly with the pandemic, we were stuck inside. We weren't getting out and getting as much exercise as much as we wanted, or even just going to and from work. We lost that ability. So getting out and getting moving, doing something as simple as walking a little bit every day can be really beneficial. Losing some weight. Uh, a lot of us in the U.S. are overweight or obese. We just don't have the best diet. And like I said, the pandemic didn't help us at all either. And then one that kind of falls into both categories as modifiable but not modifiable is something called sleep apnea. So if you've ever heard someone that snores really loudly and kind of chokes as they snore, that's usually a sign for sleep apnea. Although we might not necessarily be able to change the fact that we have it, we can change that we can treat it. So using machines like a CPAP machine or an APAP machine when we sleep, losing some weight, and there's even some surgeries out there that can help change the sleep apnea or reverse it, if you will, re resolve it. Wow, this is very sobering. Yep, there's a lot of things we don't realize that put us at risk for, for things like diabetes, for sure. I, I definitely didn't know when I was younger, certain things like the weight particularly for me was a big issue. And once I lost that weight and started getting activity into my life, I was able to reverse it. Right, well, many of our veterans who have been in the Gulf Wars um, have sleep apnea. It's one of those presumptive things now, so. That's sobering that you've got a generation of young service members now already at risk for diabetes just because of that. That's and I can tell you as a military PA, I diagnosed a lot of people in this current war on terror generation that also have sleep apnea, whether yeah. it's mild, moderate, severe. It was something that I was seeing quite regularly and referring people for to get studies done to make sure that truly was the diagnosis that they have. Right. Wow. Okay. So we're going to shift gears a little bit into why it's important to figure out if we have diabetes and start managing it with diet, nutrition, and sometimes medications. There are a lot of complications that come from diabetes. 
most people tend to think of like the amputation side of things, someone losing some toes or maybe even most of a foot. And that's for a couple of different reasons. So one of the things that we know about people with diabetes is they have sensory changes, particularly we see it in their extremities, like their toes, their feet. Sometimes it's pain, but it eventually can lead to loss of sensation. So we don't know if we're having an issue with our foot necessarily. The other part that leads to those amputation is our body doesn't manage infection as well. Our immune system isn't as strong as it should be because of all that extra sugar coursing through our bodies. And so with not having the sensation correctly that we need to know when there's an issue and then our body not being able to fight infections as well and maybe even being a breeding ground for certain infections, it really sets up for a bad bacterial infection that can lead to like gangrene. So death of the tissue that needs to be amputated. But there's a whole lot of other issues that go along with uncontrolled or not diagnosed diabetes. And so the most common things we see is actually vision issues and kidney issues. Those are the first two body systems or organs that are actually affected by diabetes. And most people don't realize that there's damage being done until it's too late. Other things that we see are um, issues with like our cardiovascular system. So getting us more at risk for stroke, heart disease, heart attacks. There's a much increased risk for heart attacks as well. And then quality of life things like sexual dysfunction. So erectile dysfunction is a big problem for, for men who deal with diabetes. And there's also some sexual dysfunction for women as well. So we kind of touched on a little bit, what are some of the ways that we can reduce our risk of developing diabetes or in some cases even help manage it? So we talked about that weight loss, uh, as little as 10 to 20 pounds can really shift those sugar levels down, getting more active. And, we have this connotation, especially military vets, like, oh, I ran every day for years. I don't want to run anymore. It doesn't have to be running. It just has to be active, getting your heart rate up for 30 minutes a day, most days out of the week. So walking is easy. It's free. You don't need anything special. Doing some body weight resistance activities. Yes, I know we all hate push-ups, but those are great body weight activities, even if you're doing them against a wall. Eating less pasta, more protein. So that's not specifically that, but really looking at what we're getting for refined carbohydrates in our diets, the pastas, the chips, breads, the unrefined sugars that we, we consume and try to get more healthy proteins and vegetables and fruits into our diet. We talked about smoking. Any time is a good, stop to, a good time to stop using cigarettes and other nicotine products, getting tested and treated for sleep apnea if that's a concern. There are certain medications that your clinician might recommend, even if you're pre-diabetic, that can help reduce the um, pre-diabetes diagnosis. And if you are diabetic and there's concern because your levels are really high, they might recommend medications even with nutrition and diet as well, just to help get the complications or the risk of complications under control fast. And then bariatric or weight less surgery might be an option for some people as well, especially if there are complications that are already arising and we need a more rapid weight loss. But just realize that surgery isn't going to be necessarily be a fix and you might not be a good candidate if your blood sugars are really out of control. Later on, we're gonna hear from Meredith who's gonna talk about nutrition for surgery, but there are surgeons out there that for elective surgeries like knee and hip replacements won't go forward with it if your blood sugars are too out of control because of the risk of infection and complications that can arise. Wow. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yep, I, uh, I see it a lot in the clinic that I work with. I have people who need to have surgery because of the diabetes that they deal with the complications to their feet and they can't get it because their blood sugars are so high uh, that it's just not safe at this point. So then they have to live with the pain of their feet hurting and then they can't walk and their quality of life starts to go down rapidly with that. Wow, okay. So what are some ways that we might be able to lose some weight on our own? This is from the National Weight Loss Registry. They keep track of different things that people do to lose weight and keep it off. So we have eating breakfast every day with about 80% of people, stepping on a scale once a week, less TV or screen time in general, which again, challenging for some of us, and then getting an hour of exercise a day. Not all of these are gonna work for all of us. I don't eat breakfast. I am not hungry when I wake up. I usually don't eat anything until about 11. I get a cup of coffee, I'm good to go. But I do step on a scale once a week and I have since I started my weight loss journey over, over 15 years ago now. Um, I work in front of a computer most days. I do telemedicine. So obviously screen time is a challenge for me, but I make sure and I get up and move between each one of my patients. I definitely try and limit my screen time after work hours so that I'm not continuing to look at a computer. 
And then I don't exercise an hour every day, but I definitely will at least get a 30 minute walk in if I can't get to a good run or more of a resistance training exercise. So I do a lot of this or variations of this. Like we talked about, walking is the easiest form of exercise if your body will allow it. Granted, I know a lot of us in the military, we have knee, we have hip, we have back problems, but even excuse me, if we start slow, just walking, you know, down to the end of the driveway or back or down the block and back and start building up that tolerance and resistance, it can really make a big difference in terms of weight management and weight loss. There's some simple things I, I do. Um, I take the stairs wherever possible. When I go to a building, I don't take the elevator. Um, and then also, you know, park far away at the mall as opposed to up close. So I have to walk all the way. First of all, it saves my car from getting shopping cart dings, but <laughs> yeah. second, well, it gets me out there walking. So, you know, these people are driving and circling. I'm like already parked and walked and they're still driving and circling. And, you know, both of those are excellent ways to get a little bit more steps into your day and get a little bit more cardiovascular exercise. I made the genius decision of moving into a third floor walk up when I came back to Savannah. So I'm forced to go up flights of stairs every single day, which for me has been important during the pandemic when I wasn't getting out as much as I wanted to, as much as I needed to, to get that exercise. I can just go up and down those stairs a few times and I was definitely getting a workout. Cool. So one of the things that's a challenge with losing weight with controlling diabetes, using nutrition to kind of get healthier is we can easily fall into fad or yo-yo dieting. Um, there's a whole slew out there. You know, there's the South Beach diet. There is the military diet. There's, I've even heard of a pomegranate diet. The Atkins you most, diet. You have the Atkins diet, ketogenic diet. So not all of those, but a lot of those like the South Beach, like the um, pomegranate and the military diet, they really focus on calorie restriction, which short term might be a positive thing, but long term, is it sustainable? Can we really restrict our calories that long and be successful? One thing, our body gets used to that restriction and goes into a, a starvation mode, so we don't want to lose it as much. But then we also tend to relapse. We fall back into our old eating habits because it's really hard to stay restricted in what we're eating. Ones like Atkins ketogenic diet, which keto is very popular these days. Those aren't so calorie restrictive. In fact, they don't really care at all about calories. But the question I always ask people, is this something you can maintain long-term? And I'm not talking like a few months. I'm not even talking a year. I'm talking years, decades. Can you maintain this? Some people have to maintain certain diets because of medical reasons, but people who don't necessarily need to do that, lots of times will relapse with these more restrictive type diets. And so when we look at particularly the calorie restrictive ones, the data that's there, there's not a lot of long-term data. Yeah, we might lose the weight really fast, but then we tend to relapse, put it back on and maybe put more weight back on afterwards, that yo-yoing effect back. Mm -hmm. It can be that weight cycling really stressful on our body and our body systems, depending on how, especially how big of an extreme, like if you lose, you know, 80 pounds over the course of several months, but then you put it all back on, that's a lot of weight that your body organs are having to get used to losing and then putting back on. It's a lot of stress that we're putting on our bodies. Mm -hmm. For women specifically, we lower the heart protective health, uh, cholesterol that we have. So that HDL is what we call it. And so that's supposed to be really good for protecting our heart from heart attacks and just generally being healthy. And so with this fad dieting, yo-yo dieting, we do see that number lower for a lot of women. Plus or minus, it might help with diabetes. Like we talked about my experience in the beginning, I started off with a calorie restrictive diet. I was on 1200 calories a day for about six months. I worked with a nutritionist though. And then we added back in so that I wasn't so calorie restrictive because it was hard. I had to plan out every single meal, every single day, do a lot of prep work. And I was starting to get bored with it. And so right around that board time, she started adding things back in where it wasn't restrictive. I wasn't always being worried about my calorie intake, but more the nutritional value I was getting. So that did help me get my diabetes, pre-diabetes diagnosis reversed, but definitely not something I could maintain long-term. And then they also put us at risk for heart disease and, and greater risk for heart attacks and stuff. And particularly if we already have a family history of those types of medical conditions, that further increases that risk. So let's talk a little bit about carbohydrates. I've talked about them a little bit. We're really going to focus in on this because carbohydrates are important when we're talking about prediabetes and diabetes. And so we need to understand their role in the whole process, right? So carbs, 
get broken down into glucose, which is a simple sugar in our bodies. Glucose is used by the body for fuel. So we need glucose. Our brain definitely uses a lot of glucose throughout the day. And then our body does too, particularly when we're active. We can also get energy from proteins and fats. That's why diets like Atkins and ketogenic work, but the body doesn't break them down as easily as carbohydrates. It takes a lot more energy and work to do that. So understanding that role is important. If you remember from one of the very early slides we had, uh, type two diabetes means that we're not really managing our insulin as well. It's not doing what it needs to in our bodies. For a healthy individual, when carbs get broken down into simple sugar, so into that glucose, insulin is then released into the body to help the sugar into our individual cells that need it for energy. And then the rest is transferred over to our liver for storage purposes. And then it's kind of released as we need it when we're kind of in between meals. For people with prediabetes, diabetes, particularly type two, insulin isn't working as efficiently, maybe not even at all if it's very severe. And enough isn't being produced, leaving higher levels of sugar kind of circulating through that body, which is what leads to those complications. And those levels stay elevated outside of mealtimes. Like we expect sugar levels to go up during and after mealtimes, but they should come back down to a nice healthy level in between. So it should be kind of like a wave. But with diabetics, they're not waving. It's just staying elevated with maybe small little waves. These increased sugar levels, like I mentioned, lead to damage in all sorts of body systems, starting with the eyes, starting with the kidneys, and then leading on to some of those other complications that we talked about. But it doesn't mean we need to completely avoid carbohydrates. Instead, we need to find better options for ones that don't cause that spike in our sugar levels and that don't keep us maintaining super high between our meals. So no two carbs are alike. Some are better than others, right? Uh, Looking for unrefined, unprocessed carbohydrates is ideal. When we think of that, like the easiest things to go to are going to be like your vegetables, uh, non-starchy vegetables, particularly a lot of fruits, whole grains that are high in fiber, which we'll talk about fiber in a minute. But then there's also ones we should avoid, right? We need to avoid potatoes on a regular basis. They're very starchy. That starch is a carbohydrate that gets very easily converted into sugar in our body. Also, you know, white rice, white bread, regular pasta, all of those things that taste nice and delicious, exactly. they don't have a lot of nutritional value, sadly. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, I'm looking here at starchy vegetables. When you say beans, you mean like pinto beans, kidney beans, garbanzo beans, all of those beans are not good? Different beans, but beans in moderation are still really good. Um, it's when we kind of go overboard. So same thing, potatoes aren't bad. We just need to use them in moderation. Bananas are another one. Bananas are really great nutritionally, but for diabetics, not something we should probably be having regularly, like daily or even multiple times within a week, because there's so many carbohydrates of simple sugars already that get very easily converted into, um, into glucose in our body and our free floating. But Beans also have a, a positive thing in them. They have fiber, which is actually really beneficial for a whole slew of reasons to include helping manage our um, blood sugar levels a little bit better. So some beans are better than others. There are some that have more fiber, less carbohydrates overall than others. And so it's looking at that nutritional label, which we'll also talk about here in just a minute to figure out what ones are gonna be the best ones to kind of rotate through your diet more regularly than others. Okay, cool. So this leads perfectly into our discussion about fiber. Fiber is a carbohydrate. It has a whole slew of benefits for us in terms of our health. It can help with people who have high cholesterol, managing that not great cholesterol, the LDL level. It helps us feel full for longer, particularly when we're pairing it with enough water so that we're not as hungry in between meals and we're less likely to snack. So also aiding in weight loss in that respect. It helps keep our bowels moving regularly, having that normal bowel movement every day, multiple times a day, maybe. Um, and so, like I mentioned, it's also really beneficial in helping people manage blood sugars better, their body to manage blood sugars a little bit better. It kind of boosts that ability to regulate a little bit more. So now let's talk about nutritional labels, because I also kind of touched on that a little bit. They can be very overwhelming, especially if you don't know what you're looking for, right? So this is one of the first thing the nutritionist and I worked on, because I'll be honest, at 22, I couldn't tell you if I'd ever looked at a nutritional label. I probably hadn't. Um, I can guarantee I probably hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
when I first started looking, I was really overwhelmed because you have this top portion that has some things on it, but then you have this bottom portion that has other things on it. What am I supposed to be looking at? With diabetes specifically, not taking into account any other possible thing you might be dealing with, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, we're most concerned about the total carbohydrate section, right? We've already been kind of talking about the important role of carbohydrates in diabetes, prediabetes. Mm -hmm. So that total carbohydrate number is important, but what's underneath it is just as important, in some cases more important. So we wanna look at the fiber quantity and ideally, especially if we're looking at processed foods, we're seeing an increased amount of fiber. So when I go buy bread, which I don't do very often, it's not something that's really a part of my diet anymore. I'm looking for something that has at least three, if not four grams of fiber per slice. Um, we're looking at the total added sugar. So we're making sure they're not putting too much sugar into it to make it taste good so that we keep eating it. And so those two numbers are just as important as that total carbohydrate. I'm not really concerned about those bottom numbers. Those are what we consider micronutrients. So the vitamins, the minerals, mm -hmm. if we're eating a pretty well-balanced diet with fruits and vegetables, protein, we should be getting what we need. And I really only look at those if I feel like I haven't been getting that recently, maybe in the winter when I was living in the Northeast where fruits and vegetables are a little bit more expensive. Maybe I'm looking at them a little bit more, but nine times out of 10, they're not even on my radar. Mm -hmm. So for those of you watching this versus those of you listening to this, what we're looking at right now are three different food labels. And so Cersei, I actually would love you to kind of look at them and tell me which one you think is going to be the best option, kind of based on what we talked about on the carbohydrate section. And so we have one on the left that has 30 total carbohydrates, two grams of fiber, about 12 grams of added sugar. Middle, we have 56 total carbohydrates, three grams of fiber, uh, and 18 added sugars without the milk content. And then on the far right, we have 32 total carbohydrates, six grams of fiber, and 10 added sugar, or 10 total sugars with nine of those added. Well, I, even though it's a lot more calories, I guess this one that's uh, the, the one that's 210 calories is your one on the right. Yeah. And what makes you think that? Well, because it's got more fiber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and not too bad on the added sugars either. Yeah. I've no, I don't think I've ever seen a label that has this nine grams of added sugars. Is that new this year or? No, it's not. So let's look at what they actually are. So that first one with the 30 grams of total carbohydrates is lucky charms actually not as bad as you think it's going to be for you in terms of like added sugar, total carbohydrates. My partner likes to give this to his kids because it's one of the better options of the kids cereal. Middle, we have Smart Start. So most people think Smart Start, they're thinking, oh, Kellogg's nice and healthy. It says antioxidants on the label. This is a great option. Uh, it's a great option if you're doing fat restriction, because if you look up top, there's not a lot of fat in it but it has the most carbohydrates. It has very limited fiber and it has the most added sugar. Yeah, that was interesting. 56 grams of carbs. Um, that's a lot for a bowl of cereal. And it is. carb counting because of the yep. nutrition, that's not good. Nope, you're right. And it's not that much fiber if you're looking at the ratio, right? Maybe if it had like six grams of fiber, maybe, but three for that much, that much carbohydrate. And it does have a lot of added sugar. 18 grams of sugar is a lot to add to a cereal. So they're trying to make this taste really good because there's not a lot of fat in it that would also add to that flavor. Oh, I'm interested. The last one, I agree with you, is probably the one I would recommend. Not the most affordable, sadly, but it is probably the most nutritional. Kashi. Um, so this is one brand of Kashi. I actually, my favorite one is the Kashi Go Lean Original. It has a little bit less added sugar, a little bit less carbohydrates. It's the one I've actually been eating for years, but it has the most fiber. It has the least added sugar. When you're comparing it, it's going to keep you full longer. It's got some, um, it actually has a little bit of a sweetness to it without adding a lot of extra sugar to it as well. This one also has the added bonus of, if you look at the protein level, it has the most protein out of all of them too. So right. you're getting 10 grams of fiber just in one bowl of cereal. Yeah. 10 grams of protein. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, Kashi is my, my preferred one, but I also know it's not always the cheapest. So I usually look for it when it's on sale. And if I also have a coupon for it, because I'm cheap and I like to not have to spend a ton of money on it, but this is my cereal. If I'm going to have cereal, I prefer the Kashi Go Lean ones. Yeah. 
Yeah, Kashi's good. It is. So more on carbs, right? We've been talking about carbohydrates a lot. Carbohydrate counting can be done in several different ways. So on the screen here is a, it's actually quite a large sheet, a handout that clinicians can give to you as the patient. That kind of is a quick cheat sheet for counting carbs per meal. There's also a variety of phone apps or websites that you can use that you can input your food. Sometimes they scan in, some you can just search for them. Um, no two are better than the other one. So really it's whatever you prefer. And then there's also the old adage of just, you know, taking a piece of paper, jotting down what you're eating, and then figuring out what the average carbs are by going and looking them up online. Uh, any way works, whatever is going to work with you the best and stick with you the best is what I recommend to people. Ideally, what we're looking for is 45 to 60 carbs per meal for a woman, a little bit more 60 to 75 per men, and then snack somewhere between 15 to 30 per each sitting. Ideally with diabetics, we're leaning more towards the lower end of that, but occasional meals, if they're a little bit higher, that's okay as well. I will tell you, I did carb counting because I have blood sugar issues. Um, mm -hmm. I have reactive hypoglycemia and that's exciting. But when I did the carb counting, I found I was so full all the time because I had to eat, you know, the three meals, the two snacks to keep my blood sugar stable. Mm -hmm. And I was stuffed. I mean, it, and I lost a lot of weight. And at yep. the time I was, you know, kind of in mourning that thinking I was, you know, really sick. I was pre-diabetic and it was terrible. And, and, and people were telling me how good I was looking. And I was like, yeah, but I'm dying. I've got pre-diabetes. I'm going to die of diabetes. And once I started carb counting, um, all my problems went away. I didn't have any issues. The A1C was better. The, um, um, I still looked good. And I spun that to like, I feel good. I'm full all the time. So I don't feel like I have to go grab that ice cream out of the freezer. And, um, you know, people still complimented how healthy I looked, you know? So I can't say enough about doing the carb counting the way the nutritionists suggest, not like the diet fad books, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, so I didn't do carb counting when I first started losing my weight journey. Um, at the time it, it wasn't something that my nutritionist and I worked on, but what I do now that is more part of my life now is I do pay attention to the carbohydrates that I'm getting. And I can tell the days that I'm way too high if I'm not keeping track of it, because I feel a little lethargic. Mm -hmm. I feel just kind of like, eh, and I have to kind of tweak my diet in the next few days to get back on track. So it really does make a big difference. It can be a little challenging up front because it's a new thing that you're doing, a new thing you're learning. But I once you get into the rhythm, do you find it still, do you still do it at this point? Um, I can kind of guesstimate now. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. know, but at the beginning I was weighing and measuring. It was yeah. very time consuming. And, you know, you're carrying around like six little Pyrex bowls. <laughs> <Yeah>. of <different laughs> But yeah. you do, you can start saying, oh yeah, this was, you know, this is a portion, you know, this handful of whatever is about the serving. So it, it is, it is a lot easier, but you know, what's good is you should enjoy cooking. You should enjoy putting, you know, planning your meals out. And so this is a really, it forces you to do that, but then you can start getting creative. You know, you only have, you know, 45 carbs. Let's see what we can do. Let's add extra spices. Let's do something. Yeah. You know, yep. let's combine foods you wouldn't ordinarily eat together. Um, so, so I thought it worked really well. It does. I, I haven't had a blood sugar attack or whatever I call them for, a, you know, four or five years. Awesome. And yeah. so I don't have the backside of this form up here, but actually in the backside of this sheet, when I hand it out to my patients at the clinic, there are actual like hand measurements. So if I look at my hand, my hand is about a cup when I put it into a fist, my palm is about four ounces for meat purposes. And so it actually gives you some hand estimates to make it a little bit easier for people when you're out and about. So like you said, you were carrying around stuff to measure stuff when you were going and doing things. This helps people do that estimating a little bit easier, particularly in those early stages, get it so that more a visual thing versus having to measure, having to weigh everything out. Right. So another thing that we could do is use the plate method for kind of uh, rough estimates, if you will. The plate method has kind of replaced that old pyramid way of getting serving sizes of things. And 
when we're looking at this in terms of diabetes, it's really good because if you look at this, half of our plate is filled with non-starchy vegetables. So we're not sitting there having to measure out, you know, I have this half cup of rice that I'm going to put right here and I'm going to put my salad here. You can just use the, the side. So half of your plate for those healthy vegetables, those non-starchy vegetables, because those are lower in carbohydrates already. We use a quarter of that plate for starchy vegetables or whole grains. So brown rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes are a great option, uh, or the occasional mashed potato would be okay. And then using that last quarter for our protein, right? Because as Americans, we tend to overconsume our protein amount. We overestimate what we're getting. And so by using just that quarter, we're more likely to have it closer to like three to four ounces, which is the recommended amount per sitting. Okay. Then it's also a lot easier. Like you said, again, with that whole measuring cup, kind of bringing stuff with you, yeah. you don't need to worry about that. Yeah, no, that's, this is good. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how do we eat in this modern day kind of crazy world that we live in. We can kind of think of foods falling into three different categories, right? So we have healthy foods, we have cheap foods, we have fast convenient foods. And typically we can fit two of those categories probably not all three. In fact, it's really challenging to find all three. So, you know, cheap and fast being our fast food options. And even those healthy fast food options typically have hidden sugars, hidden fats in them when we're eating out at fast food restaurants. We have healthy and convenient. So that would be like all those meal prep services, which I know are really popular with soldiers, sometimes soldiers family, but the problem with those, they tend to be super expensive. Um, and then you have cheap and healthy. So dried beans, right? Dried beans are like the quintessential cheap, healthy food, but they take time. You have to rehydrate them. You have to then prepare them. It's not a quick process. So if you have that time kind of time, that's great. But what if you don't have that kind of time? So then what are some foods that potentially can fall into all three of those categories? Do you have any ideas? Well, I was thinking canned beans. Yes, actually, I would agree with you on that one. Yeah. Um, let's see, beans. All right. Let's see what else. Cheap, healthy, fast. I like oatmeal. I'm not sure it has anything to do with it. You know, any actually, oatmeal is not a bad one. I didn't even think that's actually one I've been asking this question for a while and no one's come up with that one, but that's actually a pretty good one, especially if you're not doing one of the like added sugar ones. You're just doing straight yeah. oatmeal and yeah. adding your own maybe yeah. cinnamon or something to it. Yeah. Um, so Yes, I, I like oatmeal because it has fiber. Um, it has some other like nutrients in it. It's not horrible in the carbs if you're measuring it out. I can do oatmeal. I would and say a big salad and then add some protein things in it, like maybe chopped nuts or. Um, but then you're going into that prep time. So then we're taking time up. All right, well, help us out then because my brain, ooh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the response I usually get from people, honestly. So I know it's so tofu is a challenging one, but it is a great, fast, cheap, healthy option. It takes on the flavor of whatever you're cooking it in. It's right. You can, you can cook it well. I had a bad experience, but yeah. And a lot of, the consistency really throws people off of it, um, but it has no carbs. That's the thing about it. It's zero carbs, high protein, but it is soy based. So that can be a problem for some people as well. Um, and so I would say these two are your best option. I know beans fall into and legumes fall into that starchy mm -hmm. kind of vegetable, like we talked about, but there are good options that you can still incorporate and still keep it nice and healthy. As long as we're not adding in outside carbohydrates, so sugar or breading or things like that. Right. So we're coming towards the end of my pre-diabetes diabetes talk. Let's just do a quick recap on what we've covered. So we've talked about what diabetes is, what some of the risk factors are about it, ones we can change, ones we can't change, the complications that come, come arise from undiagnosed diabetes or just poorly controlled diabetes, how we can prevent it, finding sustainable ways of eating. So talking about the, the oatmeal, which I really do like, uh, beans, tofu, the role of that fiber that we get from things like oatmeal and beans and how important it is in weight management, blood control, blood sugar control, how to read nutritional labels and the surprising things that can come from reading nutritional labels, carb counting. And then last but not least, that plate method, which makes measuring carbohydrates a little bit easier. So do you have any other questions that we haven't hit on at this point? No, I think that was really good. Actually, I do. So you said walking and then you said a heart rate up. I mean, I walk 10,000 to 12,000 steps a day, but I'm not 
panting? Do I need to be picking up my pace or is walking alone just good enough? So what we're aiming for, and it, this may be something that you have to gradually increase to, maybe not right away getting to this, but we want at least 150 minutes of cardiovascular activity a week. And that's why I said 30 minutes, five times a week of walking, where it's not just our normal pace, but we're picking it up a little bit. So we're getting that heart rate up. We're getting the blood flowing a little bit more than we normally would. So if you feel like you're doing that already, you're probably good to go. But if you're feeling like you're just kind of walking to and from places, getting those steps, and that's a good start, but trying to incorporate a little bit more where we're getting that heart rate up, getting a little bit more exercise in is definitely beneficial. All right. I see all sorts of things I need to change in my life. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so next up, I'm going to lead into Meredith. We kind of talked about a little bit about diabetes and the complications that can arise, but Meredith is actually going to talk more specifically about different types of pre and post-op nutritional things that can really help us bounce back after, after a surgery. So Meredith, you're up. Well, welcome. Meredith. All right. Thank you so much. Chelsea, every time I listen to that, I'm challenged with something new or I think of new questions or even things in my own life to change or, or make a little better. So thanks again. Um, and thanks, Cersei, for having us. We are so excited about um, nutrition and how to incorporate it into medicine and specifically our patients' daily lives and how we can all make small improvements. That's what we're all about. And so this section specifically focuses on surgery. So I just want to touch on, you know, preparing for successful surgery outcomes. And, you know, many of us find ourselves needing surgery for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, osteoarthritis. Um, a lot of people, especially veterans, find ourselves at some point, you know, we've had this problematic knee or hip or shoulder that we say, okay, it is, you know, a lot of people say it is worn out. <laughs> and so um, that is usually due to wear and tear, overuse, a lot of of years of being really hard on our joints. And so for joint replacements is a great example of a surgery that we know is coming, we can prepare for it, and how can we best bounce back afterwards? And so I am very passionate about this because I work in orthopedic surgery. And so, um, you know, a lot of patients come in wanting to feel better, wanting to get back to their activities and wanting to know how can I what can I do on my part to make this the best outcome possible? And those are the patients that I just love to talk to because they want to take ownership and, and you know, what, what can they do? Like I alluded to. And so that's why we talk about nutrition before and after surgery. So, um, and, and again, sometimes we, we can't prepare for surgery, but those that we can prepare for this, um, is, is related to those. You know, this is interesting because you never think about food. Uh, you know, you think about being in a hospital and having crummy food, but you never think about <laughs> eating foods to make things better afterwards. It's kind of weird. I'm interested to hear this. Right. And, and a lot of research has been done in this area because we all know, okay, you can't eat before surgery. And then it's a bit difficult to eat afterwards, but what can we do? You know, these things are within our control. Um, and so poor nutrition leads to poor surgical outcomes. We know this, um, you know, patients with poor nutrition are more likely to take a longer time to get better. And some can even die because of malnutrition after surgery. And so they stay longer in the hospital or a nursing home. And they're also more likely to get readmitted to the hospital. So nobody wants to go back, just do your surgery and be done. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can go next slide. So the, the, if we eat well before surgery, like I said, we, we have less complications, less likely to even develop an infection. And so we, every surgeon is trying to figure out how do we lower our risk of infection? And this is a big part of it is malnutrition. Wow. And when you say malnutrition, you don't just mean like really skinny, um, starving people. You're talking about healthy looking people that just don't have good body flora or who, who don't have good nutrition, right? I mean, absolutely. That that's a great question because we can actually be obese and still be malnourished. That sounds like an oxymoron, but it is possible to be obese, but we don't have good nutrition in order to fuel our bodies before and after surgery. So important foods prior to surgery, we want to increase our protein. And this is the 
big key that we haven't known about previously, but now all the research is showing if we impre- increase our protein prior to surgery, we have more strength afterwards. And it makes sense, you know, more, you know, the bodybuilders you think of taking the protein powder. Well, even if we, any of us who are having surgery increase our protein before, then our outcome afterwards is better. Um, a high protein diet is recommended for one week before and four to eight weeks after surgery. So those are kind of the key windows of time. And when you look at the daily recommended do- allowance for protein, we actually double that prior to and after surgery. Wow. And then I just want to touch on that last bit, sorry, there. Um, when you talk with your surgeon about, you know, what's the plan? What are we doing here? Prehab is also really important, just as Chelsea alluded to about exercise as it relates to diabetes and pre-diabetes, exercise is so important preparing for surgery. It's almost, you know, you imagine going into surgery, you can't expect to get stronger after than you were before. So we really encourage people to be active and even go, if, you, if you're able to, if your insurance covers it, if TRICARE covers it, going to rehab or physical therapy prior to surgery sets you up for more success afterwards. Wow. So this slide talks about a 24 hour recall. And so kind of challenging yourself to go back through, okay, well, how much protein am I getting? You know, it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, I think I eat a bit of protein, but really breaking it down just like carb counting. It's kind of a, a reality check of how much are you actually getting? And so, um, there are many great resources to help us accurately assess our own diets and determine how much protein we need before and after surgery. And so the 24 hour recall is one example. So just to go through this chart, an ounce of meat or one whole egg is about seven grams. One cup of milk is about eight grams. And then the starches that, that Chelsea alluded to, the one third to half cup of pasta, cereal, oatmeal, rice, or beans is about three grams of protein or also one slice of bread, depending on what type of bread you get. And then half a cup of cooked vegetables or one cup of raw vegetables is two grams of protein. So for example, three ounces of meat equals 21 grams of protein. So that's kind of um, an estimate for your daily 24 hour recall. So what is three ounces of meat? Like how much is a lamb chop, for example, like a regular- Good question. So the palm, we kind of use the palm method. The palm of your hand is about three to four ounces. Oh, yep, we can we can see it here. Perfect hey. example. Perfect segue. Um, at the, about a deck of cards or the palm of your hand is three to four ounces. And then if you think about, if you're, you're thinking about cheese, think about four dice. That's about an ounce of cheese. And then eight ounces of milk, so a cup is eight grams of protein. And then here's just a a little example for a person who weighs 150 pounds, two eggs in the morning, three ounces of meat at lunch, and five ounces at dinner equals a total of 70 grams of protein for that day from animal sources. And we, as I said earlier, we need to double that amount in the period before and after surgery. So that's going to be a lot of protein. That's huge. Wow. Right. Mm. And then we, we can also go into, you know, a lot of people say, as you said, Cersei, when you were counting carbs, you felt so full all the time. So people who are not used to eating this much protein might say, wow, I literally cannot fit that much in my stomach. Um, there are also oral supplement options. You know, you've seen like high protein drinks and things like that. A um, lot of different options there. The pros is they're easy to reach your protein goals. You can easily, you read on the label, you know how many grams you're getting, mm-hmm. and it's, it's pretty easy to consume that. The cons are that they can be expensive, and they're also not regulated by the FDA, just as other supplements are not. And we need to really look closely at other added ingredients, specifically added sugars. That's a, that's a big red flag there. So watch out for that. And then immunonutrition is, is something kind of new and different, specific um, to people who are having surgery. And it contains a few different items, arginine, which aids in wound healing, omega-3 fatty acids, and also antioxidants. So this is something that your surgeon might recommend, probably if you have a complication. I would not say this is recommended for your run-of-the-mill surgical patient. Mm-hmm. Come on. And then we're looking at dietary sources. Sometimes you just need an idea of what, what other things have protein. Like for me, I kind of get stuck in a rut, you know, and you just need some suggestions. What else could I include for protein in my diet? So we've got the, the kind of 
normal suggestions of eggs, chicken, lean beef, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, tuna, turkey, fish, or shrimp. And then for those that are plant-based, we have buckwheat, hummus, and then the soy products that Ch Chelsea talked about, tofu, tempeh, edamame. We've got peanut butter, beans and rice. And then I wanted to add this to Chelsea's, the quick, cheap, and healthy. I think quinoa is a good one. It cooks in about 15 minutes. You can combine it with beans or you can throw it on a salad. Uh, quinoa is a really good one. And then hemp seeds, chia seeds, and also spirulina has some protein in there. What is spirulina? I've seen that. Good question. It's um, a lot of times you see it in powdered form. It's the green powder that basically comes from plants. So it can come from different sources. It can come from algae or any type of um, spinach or leafy greens like that. But usually it's in a powdered form. Okay. And then as we, as we said earlier about um, the, the um, immunonutrition, it includes arginine, which I said in, in aids in wound healing. And so if you're thinking, okay, I'm probably not gonna buy an immunonutrition supplement. What can I use that, or what can I eat in my normal diet that has arginine in it? So some suggestions would be turkey, pork, chicken, pumpkin seeds, soybeans, peanuts, again, spirulina, chickpeas, and lentils. And then again, the omega-3 omega fatty acids have been shown to help with wound healing as well after your surgery. And so you can find those in salmon, herring, anchovies, sardines, trout. And then also a lot of us take a fish oil supplement. Just make sure that it has EPA and DHA included. So this omega-3 fatty acids is only from fish? Typically, yes. Those are... It's a part of, you know, you might take a fish oil supplement, but it includes omega-3 fatty acids in there. Okay. And then what, why do we need to include protein? What, what does protein, carbs, and fats have to do with me recovering from surgery, right? So protein, as we alluded to, promotes building of lean body mass. We, when we maximize our protein stores prior to surgery, we reduce our surgical complications afterwards. And then carbohydrates, you know, sometimes when you go to the pre-op meeting, they'll tell you, all right, we want you to drink this clear liquid drink the night before surgery, you know, stop eating at midnight or whatever time they tell you. Um, and why do they do that? Well, this helps improve insulin resistance following surgery, even though it seems counterintuitive. I'm drinking this sweet drink. Oh, how is that going to help me? Um, and, and here's the caveat not for patients who have diabetes. So this is for patients with normal blood glucose and normal A1Cs. Um, it improves psychological well-being after surgery. So patients who are um, carb loaded, they actually feel better afterwards because they don't feel so depleted, if you will. And then improved post-op nausea and vomiting, uh, reduced length of stay in the hospital. And then uh, again, you, you don't wanna do this in, in poorly controlled diabetics. Um, and then the last part, fats, what do they have to do with healing after surgery? They do have some antioxidant properties and some of our healthiest sources, just as kind of a side note reminder, extra virgin olive oil, almonds, walnuts, avocados, fish, and flax for our, um, fats for recovering after surgery. And then just a little bit on nutrient timing. So we've had some people say, okay, if I'm supposed to take in this amount of protein, what's the best time of day to do it? Do I do it all in one, you know, one big bang in the morning or how do I do it? And um, just as you would probably intuitively guess, a high protein diet um, is best throughout the day, you know, spaced evenly, we, we can absorb it better. Uh, but a, an analogy I really like to talk to my patients about is the high protein diet is the same range that we feed our collegiate and professional athletes throughout their training season. And so if you think of it, just like an athlete needs to prepare for a competition, a surgery is a huge stress on our bodies that we also need to prepare for nutritionally. So we want to do the carb loading, like we talked about the glucose load, the drink, and also the protein loading, if you will, um, to, to help our bodies prepare for this big stress that we're about to undertake. So this drink, these, this carbohydrate drink, it's, is that something you buy in the store? It's specifically for surgeries or the, it's a medically prescribed to you? Good question. It can be. There are, are certain um, 
commercial drinks that are prepared for pre-surgery, but you can also accomplish the same goals with a clear grape juice. So it's a, it's a high carbohydrate content without probably the added cost. And the reason they want clear liquid is based on anesthesia to make sure they know if you're aspirating something dangerous. So it needs to be clear, but white grape juice can also um, serve the purpose and, and much less expensive. Wow. I, I had never heard that. This is <laughs> Usually it's a, a pre-op uh, planning type meeting, maybe with the anesthesiology team or, or other people involved in the surgery that will kind of um, debrief this. But Again, this is very recent research and it's, it's making a huge difference on how patients fare after surgery, especially um, you can imagine an older person who, you know, imagine a 90 year old having a total hip replacement going in, you know, most 90 year olds don't eat a lot uh, versus a 90 year old who has upped their protein, upped their carbs, and they are ready to kind of uh, undergo this onslaught. <laughs> and then they bounce back a lot faster afterwards. Wow. So just to recap, our purpose is to reduce the impact of surgery, um, to get our patients back doing what they want to do faster. Um, we can reduce length of hospital stay and complication rates, including infections. We can reduce the rate of hospital readmission and also the use of analgesia. So, you know, we know that opioids are a huge problem in our country right now. Studies have shown that we can actually decrease pain medication after surgery if we have proper nutrition reduced costs to our patients and also increased uh, patient comfort and satisfaction. People are not feeling like they're starving before and after surgery and everybody feels better when they're not starving. So um, I, I feel very, very lucky to have uh, obtained this information and I'm so excited to share it with people who I think it might make a big difference in their lives and in their um, surgical journey. And our goals are to provide nutritional support for wound healing, um, a avoid excessive loss of lean body mass, because we've seen that patients who don't have enough protein before and after surgery, they actually lose a lot of muscle um, called sarcopenia, especially our older patients. And we, we can't afford to, to do that. They, they need all the strength they can get. Um, we need to modulate the inflammation and the immune response. So we, we want to keep that immune response under control. And we want to use food and nutrients to optimize healing and recovery after surgery. And um, so I, I hope that this helps to encourage a lot of military families and veterans who are um, facing an upcoming surgery or able to share it with someone um, near that they love. Now, this has been very interesting to me. Um, and I think our, our, our viewers will see this too. Both, both of the uh, programs have been very um, easy to understand and um, make us all think, even if we think we're doing the best we are, well, we, you know, we, we always think we're doing probably better than we should. Um, this is, this has been very helpful. And the whole preoperative nutrition is something that I had never considered. Uh, so I'm sure lots of other people haven't considered it either. And the amount of protein just is mind boggling. To yes. <laughs> um, so at any rate, well, I wanted to thank you all for coming and for Wynn Park, who is um, facilitating and, and doing some of the technical uh, stuff behind the scenes uh, for, for, for coming today uh, to talk to our viewers. Um, we, we are very happy and, and grateful to be able to provide, you know, easy to understand nutritional series to a, a lot of people, you know, thanks to Zoom and internet and you know, our podcast. So um, I needed to do my commercial, my con commercial announcement that the museum's podcasts are supported by um, New Mexico Arts, New Mexico Humanities Council, uh, Sandia Area Credit Union, and organizations like Military Brats Seal and Military Brats Registry. Um, we also are working closely with the Bob Woodruff Foundation, and they are very much interested in helping veterans with um, nutrition and food insecurity um, issues. So we wanted to thank them for their support as well. So I just appreciated this afternoon's conversation. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you, you Cersei. Yeah, we enjoyed it too. We're glad to do this.